Jeff, we are live for everybody here around the world. I feel like I am in a TV show. So, hey, hello, hello, everybody. We are live with a doctor, Jeff Kuhn. It sounds so good. It's the first hey. time I think I introduced you like that. Let me, so. yeah, so let's, let's actually be a little bit more formal. Uh, so I'm going to actually read a little bit about you. So Jeff, Dr. Jeff Kuhn serves a split appointment at Ohio University, working for the Office of Instructional Innovation and the Games Research and Immersive Design, Great Lab. He works with faculty to integrate immersive media into their classroom practice. He frequently delivers talks and keynote addresses on game design, games and learning, and the need for games literacy in educators. So I could continue, but let's go directly to your presentation so i think you must have been busy during this this last few months <laughs> but thank you for being here and i'm not going to take more time from you and your presentation so be my guest and everybody is ready to listen to you great all right you know th thanks hota and i'll tell you i i have been busy the last uh the last few months it has been something and, you know, I thought that that's kind of uh, where we can really start with the, the talk tonight and really thinking about what is the context that we're in now? You know, what is, quote, the new normal for us as educators and some of the, the lessons learned over the past, you know, eight, nine months that we've seen these you know, radical changes in many of the ways we approach teaching. And so, you know, before we kind of dig into some of those things and really get into it, I did want to take a few moments uh, to say thanks. And specifically, you know, I wanted to talk, you know, way back in 2013, I was uh, talking to a colleague and, you know, the colleague was saying, there's, there's this teacher down in Peru, you've got to meet him. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate the following year, uh, thanks to Relo Andes to get to visit Peru and Bolivia on that particular trip. And when I showed up, to a workshop series in Peru, I see this. Uh, and I knew at that particular instance, I was like, I'm really gonna like this guy. And uh, ever since, you know, Hota and I have had a, a great uh, chance to really kind of dig into some of the, the technology and some of just the, the teaching practices that we, we've seen. And so um, I wanna say thanks to Hota for inviting me here tonight. And I wanted to say thanks again to Relo Andes, not just for inviting me here tonight and putting on such a you know fantastic uh, workshop series and webinars that we've seen all day today but for introducing me to hota way back when and in you know really introducing me to a host of teachers across the the country of peru across the region in south america and really kind of across the world so you know thanks again for that and really you know i keep thinking about you know this keynote and using it as a place to take stock of really where we are and what we really need to kind of be thinking about as we move forward um and you know before we do that just a little bit more about myself you know, as hota mentioned i am at ohio university where i'm currently an instructional designer and last year i could have told you what an instructional designer does um at that time you know way back decades ago it feels like back in january um instructional designers we were cool, we were calm, we were collected, and we always had the answers. Um, teacher needed help, we could help uh, and really kind of get that going. And I suppose the same could be said for teachers. You know, we knew what we were doing and we were confident in what we were doing. Um, now, you know, all the way here in October, we're, we're, we're at a loss, you know, things, things are just so different now. Um, and what's really been fantastic about these ensuing months, it's, it's been a lot of stress and it's been a lot of gray hair and um, it's been a lot of struggle for all of us, not just professionally, I'm sure for many of us, you know, personally, we've, we've had some struggles and, you know, really thinking about that as not just what we're going through, what our colleagues are going through, what our students are going through as well. We've all had kind of a, a, a tough year but um, the real lesson learned and the way I kind of want to start with this keynote is really thinking about things are different, um, but you're not alone. Uh, as I have worked with faculty 
you know, educators from across the world throughout this year, this pandemic year, um, that's probably been the most refreshing thing that everybody could um, really get together with and bond on is this idea that, you know, hey, I'm not alone. Um, and these workshop series and these webinars and conferences that we do are really important to, to think about that, that as a teacher, um, you're encountering the challenges that we're all encountering right now. And so you're not alone and we're going to get through this together. And really my keynote tonight is to highlight what are the experiences I've had over this very trying year working with educators and what are some of the big picture kind of broad approaches that can help you uh, best approach your classroom and your pedagogy and your uh, engagement with students as we move from you know a very traditional face-to-face -face approach to something that is uh, much more hybrid and, and is a mix of online and face-to-face -face or purely online what's it going to look like moving forward and so this has been a, a challenge for us all and one of the ways i like to describe this is uh you know thinking about this in terms of as educators we've always been trained for a live audience to interact with a group of people and, and feed that energy you know we get energy from our students and we give it back it's very much like theater uh, but in this last year we've really you know almost switched to being movies or film or television where suddenly we're putting out content and we don't get that immediate response and so it does require um, a little bit of change and a little bit of adapting so how do we adapt and, and how do we think of this moving forward so as i said you know with tonight i really want to focus on you know, some of those big picture ideas the best practices and sort of the theories that we can use to guide our design of our classes and the development of our classes and then uh, towards the end, you know, really kind of throw it open to the audience and, you know, say collectively, what have we learned today? Uh, what have we learned over this past year and how we can share with one another and help each other uh, moving through this new time? And so uh, to kind of really start, hey, things are new, but we have some guides. So let's get into them. And one of the first things I really like to talk about with educators as I'm working through uh, helping them develop courses. Now, those might be face-to-face -face courses. They might be hybrid courses, or it might be purely online, is um, where to begin. Because one of the most common mistakes that I see is this idea of, um, I'm teaching online, therefore, it's very technology-driven. Um, and that can often be an incorrect approach. But then um, what's problematic is the opposite approach is also just as problematic of not considering the technology and a really great approach to think about this is uh, what's called the TPAC model and I'm sure many of you have heard of this before but how can we use it to sort of guide our thought process when we develop out online courses and this is where I would love to begin with educators and thinking about developing out your material so really what it says in a big broad stroke is that there are three components to any classroom and for uh, the longest time as educators we really only focused on two of them but now uh, even before the pandemic we really didn't give enough credit to technology and thinking about how it might shape our class and so really with uh, the TPAC model, it sees an integration of pedagogy and content and technology. So when we bring content in, we are the, the subject matter expert. We know uh, how to teach English, how to teach Spanish, how to teach Arabic. Um, and we might have the pedagogy. And the way we know how to teach our pedagogy will definitely shape the way we deliver content in the class. And the content we're using will obviously shape kind of our pedagogical approaches to our classroom. And what this TPAC model by Mishra and Kohler suggests is that we also need to think about the technology and that it should shape both the pedagogy and the content. Um, they, they have this uh, approach where they say, you know, look, if we focus only on the um, pedagogy, we're not really seeing how to combine the technology with our content and really create an effective learning environment. 
And actually, I think uh, today it was really summed up well. If you managed to see the talk by uh, Gabriel Maggioli, talked really about this idea of um, acquisitional technology versus transactional use of technology. Uh, it was a really interesting talk this afternoon that he gave. So definitely check it out on YouTube uh, when these videos all go up. And really this idea of, um, you know, when we think about technology, the students will often have to grapple with what it is, how it works, and more importantly, um, how it may teach them. And that really isn't the best approach. And this is something that, you know, the TPAC model also discusses. But instead, we want to think about what Gabrielle mentioned as the transactional use of technology, where it simply is a way to communicate and engage and interact with other people. So, you know, we think about using the technology to interact with other people and then from there, really start to think about what are our learning outcomes and our objectives here? What do we want for an activity or for an introduction um, to material for our students? And then really start to think about the technology. So I think that is um, a really great place to kind of start with some of the other material coming through. So the entirety of the rest of my talk, and really as you go through the webinars tomorrow, I'm really thinking about this. If someone's mentioning a technology, um, instead of just using the technology or learning just about the technology, ask yourself, how would this change the way I deliver content? Um, is there a positive benefit in my pedagogy that may result in the use of this technology? So it's a great lens to kind of consider. So, you know, kind of moving on from there, another great place to start with technology and we're not quite sure where to begin or how to um, move forward are the uh, the TESOL technology standards. So if you're not familiar with TESOL, that is the um, teachers of English or second or other language. And they put out back in 2011 and still relevant today, these uh, tech standards where, you know, language teachers should be able to do certain tasks or achieve certain outcomes with technology. And they have a really great rubric that you can find. So you Google search the TESOL tech standards and you can go through and kind of take a snapshot of your abilities with technology and really kind of determine where your, your best approach is. And that's often my second question with educators when working on their, their new classes and their new content is saying, where are we most comfortable? What can you do? What is the technology you currently use? And where can we build off from there? You know, so starting to think about, you know, bringing in new technology only after we really kind of determined our comfort level. So, um, yeah, I just see in the chat, uh, Ergway TESOL mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Gabriel Diaz Maggioli's uh, transactional versus acquisitional technology. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. It's great. And there's so many other things I could talk about from people uh, today. And I'll hear from all, ports, uh, all sorts of people tonight because I learned a lot about things going into this workshop and I'm, I'm really happy to share them in this keynote. So uh, I'm gonna try to keep track of the chat as I, as I go. And so um, definitely feel free to share your thoughts there. And so, you know, thinking about getting a stock of technology and thinking about, okay, how is technology gonna change my approaches? How are they gonna change my subject matter? And then really thinking about, you know, things like the TESOL technology standards of what's my comfort level, what's my base ability with technology, we can really start to, to move into the design of a class. And this is a really great concept to kind of work through is the notion of backward design. And, you know, with backward design, it, you know, really was best summed up this afternoon in uh, Jamila Tango's session, if you had a chance to, to watch her session, where, said, where she said, look, pick your pedagogy and then your technology. And it's a really common mistake that I will see in course development with faculty or, you know, um, big designs of classes or lesson plans, even on a very smaller scale, is the notion that um, I'm going to pick the technology first, or, you know, I'm even going to pick the, the textbook, or I'm going to pick the, the material that my students are going to use in class first, um, and then kind of figure out the rest of class from there. Um, Backward design really suggests to flip the opposite, as Jamila said, pedagogy, then technology. And so as we go through that, you know, we really think about the traditional design of a class. It comes down to 
we got the the course content okay here's my textbook um let's see i'm gonna have them do this reading i'll have my students listen to this uh and maybe okay i'll have i'll work on this grammar point um and figure out okay well what are my students going to need there oh well, i should give them a test of some kind okay what will they have learned um and really what backward design says let's let's change that up and let's kind of flip it to a more natural setting and it really kind of comes down to um hey start with the learning outcomes first and you know really thinking about um what i need the students to do in a great way this is a colleague of mine named larry hess he he loves this question that i've i've taken to it says imagine your students in five years you you meet them at the airport or you meet them at a shop what is it that you really want them to remember about your course you say oh yeah i remember being in your class and we learned x or that's where i learned how to do y um, you know, really kind of thinking about what are those big, broad outcomes, your, your goals for your course, and then breaking those down into kind of your, your learning outcomes. All right, so really what do I want my student to be able to do at the end of this class, at the end of this unit, at the end of this course? And then from there, you know, what are those acceptable evidences of outcomes? Basically, how do you know they learned it? Um, and then from there, and only after you've identified those, do we start to identify the textbook or identify the, the technology being used? And in my experiences being an instructional designer and working with faculty, um, this is often the most common mistake because we're, we're busy. You know, faculty will, you know, educators will rush through um, to get things done. You know, we're busy grading, busy working, doing other things, but really kind of sitting down and deciding what are those learning outcomes are so important. Um, you know, basically articulate your expressions, uh, your, sorry, your expectations for the course. And so um, until we do that, we really don't know what our students should be doing. And in an online environment, that is even more critical. Uh, it's easier to get lost as a student in an online course. So how do we make sure that we give them those clear goals and make sure that everybody's kind of charting the same course uh, and arriving at the same destination? And so, you know, define those evidences of learning and then structuring out that class. And so um, I really like this example. This is a great graphic from Indiana University about backward design, where it says, you know, very clearly chart out our course goals and then the final assessment. You know, what is it going to be that determines the student's mastery of the course objectives, the course goals? And then finally, thinking about those learning outcomes. Uh, each class, each week, each unit that you may have there. And then finally, what materials and what activities do students need to engage in in order to, to meet those agendas? And so um, really, I like to think about it this way. And again, again, Indiana University gave this great example here of course goals. Uh, stop and ask yourself, how will my students be different after they have learned this material? Um, and then ask yourself, well, if that's going to be how they're different, well, how will I know that? How will I know they have changed? And then, of course, you know, as we start to work on our learning outcomes, we can you know, slow down, really kind of think about, OK, I want my students to be different. Well, here's how I know they'll change. I could do this. This could be my final assessment. Well, then what must students be able to to do or to think or demonstrate in order to be successful in that assessment. So again, you know, thinking about learning outcomes in terms of clear student actions. And then finally, um, what support and what materials and what um, learning kind of infrastructure might our students need in order to achieve those learning objectives? And really thinking about these and putting these materials out there um, very clearly in, in like a course map is a great example. You can Google course map and it'll show you all these different examples of how to plot these out um, on a week by week basis or unit by unit basis. And the most successful online classes that I've seen or helped design really spend all the time on this. And you know, if, you're, if you find yourself in a situation of being unsure what to do with students or being unsure about what technology would best fit your students, um, 
typically you can trace that back to uh, unclear goals and learning outcomes for the class. So I really highly encourage everyone to spend that time and develop and brainstorm and, and even, you know, with your, your colleagues, you know, getting into WhatsApp messaging groups or, you know, Slack channels with your, your friends and really working through these ideas together and brainstorming because it'd be very uh, enriching and you're able to really kind of find some um, new ways to deliver content that maybe you hadn't thought of before because you have that clear vision of where you want you uh, to go as an educator and where you want your students to go as learners. And so, you know, kind of thinking about that with uh, backward design and kind of planning everything out, um, the next step I like to encourage with educators is to really think about um, how do we shift from a more uh, passive style experience in the class to a more uh, active learning environment. And I'd really be curious to see everyone's thoughts in the chats or later in the, the questions for, a, um, for your thoughts on what have been the challenges for you or for uh, you know, your colleagues in thinking about shifting into the digital environment, but still keeping students active. Uh, for me, as I worked with faculty and even in a class I taught um, that had to move online in spring, it was very easy to kind of slip into a, a lecture and listen kind of format where information was delivered uh, through the webcam and, and onto the, the screen. And the students really just kind of listened, you know, um, in, in video game design, uh, we often talk about leaning in versus leaning back. And, uh, you know, the idea behind that is um, if I'm leaning back, that suggests a more passive role uh, is I'm watching TV and it's time to relax in the evening. I lean back and relax. Uh, but if I'm watching a football game and things are getting exciting, I'm starting to lean in and it's this engagement. Um, leaning forward is sort of an indicator of engagement. And so I'll ask faculty as I work through things, uh, taking a cue from uh, video game design, I'll say, when are your students leaning in in your class? When are they really kind of participating uh, versus leaning back? And so uh, thinking about this active learning context, um, there are ways we can do it that can be uh, really beneficial, even though it may seem challenging in an online environment. And so, you know, if we think about this, uh, this is something from uh, Jensen back in 2005 from the book Teaching with the Brain and Mind. And one thing to think about with this little graph that you're seeing is a little table, I'm sorry, that you're seeing is this assumes first language instructions. So this doesn't even really kind of consider second language instruction, but talking about the appropriate amount of a direct, like a lecture or direct instruction for an adult learner is only 15 to 18 minutes. Um, so we start to think about a 30 minute lecture and our students are going to lean way back. Uh, so how do we keep it short, keep it succinct, and um, really hit home ways that we can break up our material and, and try some new things? So um, Glenda Gallardo today, I was, I was in her session, and she talked about speaking time with her students and breaking out students into small speaking groups throughout the, the class, which can be a, a great example. Maybe. You send a couple of students into a breakout room uh, using your online platform where they can talk for a while. They can work on a speaking activity while you work with another group of students on a more of a direct lecture, uh, instruction of grammar, instruction of material, and break it up that way. So students get a small chunk of you, they get a small chunk of practice, and they jump back and forth. Um, I really like that idea. And another one that I really liked I saw today was um, in Daniel Goom's session where have uh, where he had students with A and B cards. And so as he's asking questions and talking, kind of lecturing, if you want to call it that, um, the students could respond. And so it was a much more engaging environment. So although it was direct instruction, there was a lot of back and forth of students. So instead of listening, they're, oh, answer B, answer A. Um, and it was really flexible too, where they could talk in the chat, they could 
post their A, B. You can even use something like Kahoot or um, you know another online platform for such a thing, but it helped break up that kind of lecture. And so really thinking about um, you know moving through these active learning environments. And let's be honest, as language educators, um, we're, we really are ahead of the curve compared to many other disciplines in education because we're so communication focused. And so we do tend to do a lot better on this, um, but it can be easy to kind of let that slip as we move to online. You know, we're all getting better. We've all had uh, months of practice now, but think about it as you design out your, your next uh, class. And then of course, thinking about active learning, thinking about that engagement, um, how do we shift up Bloom's taxonomy? Uh, I'm sure everyone is, is really familiar with this and have seen it in your um, pedagogy classes. But, you know, the idea that the remembering and understanding being kind of the basics of, of Bloom, but how do we get the students to analyze and evaluate and create in online environments? And what's really tricky about this um, and something I've gotten feedback from students on. And so sharing your thoughts about this in the chat would definitely be welcome is how do we give them the tools to analyze and create and evaluate and, and be more active in their classes without overwhelming them with, with a lot of different logins. Um, one thing that we've heard at my university from students is, uh, you know, basically software fatigue. Um, they're always going to these different websites to do different things. Um, so how do we make sure that it's as condensed and concise as possible without students having to go to many different places? Because um, it's easy for them to get lost in these online environments. Um, so balancing that out, I'd love to see everyone's uh, thoughts on that. Because um, as we work through this, we can really think about the more we get them to create and evaluate and analyze, the more we can shift away from you know, uh, lectures and, and demonstrations and um, really thinking about the bottom half this time of, of the learning pyramid. And um, Gonzalo Diaz talked about this in his session today. And again, um, so many great ideas today where we're doing this. This is something I, re I really want to stress throughout this keynote and to stress to everybody. Um, we, we see the best practices. We know what these are. And I'm seeing them all over the place in the workshops and this uh, presentations today. So this has just been a great conference um, to reaffirm that we're doing OK as a group of educators. We're, we're getting there. We're doing all right. Um, and so you know, really thinking about that of how do we give students the opportunity uh, to let them do demonstrations where it's maybe a little more hands on or discussions um, or even better practice doing. So are there ways that students can um, create videos with, you know, their cell phones so they can uh, demonstrate a particular language skill or an ability in the skill. Um, can they practice working through uh, conversations, doing um, speaking journals or doing sort of audio activities that they can share with you, um, essays, or even better, you know, teaching others. Uh, a great example that I saw in a class uh, last spring was the teacher gave every student a grammar point and they had to go out and kind of research that grammar point, find some examples, and then they taught that day's lesson about that particular grammar. So really give them a chance to get this information and then process it and analyze it and share it with others. And then the teacher took the opportunity to lean back. And the teacher said, you know what? I'm gonna let you figure this out. If there's a problem or a mistake, I'll chime in and kind of help. And that was a, um, a really great way, I think, to get the students involved. Um, and yeah, and, and I'm seeing over there in the chat, uh, Daniel is chiming in not to overwhelm the students and easier said than done. I wholly agree on that. Um, so, and, uh, you know, Rocio mentions this. It's, let's be honest, it's hard to keep students active every day. Um, totally agree. And it's not something where we have to hit it out of the park every single time you know we don't have to be successful every single time instead you know thinking about is there ways to kind of measure it out even if we can do that every other class or every third class where we can build that out um, and i feel like there's in my experience working with with teachers is it's either give it 110 percent or we're not doing well at all 
I'm saying maybe we could just try for 70 percent. Um, and again, you know, this is something where we really have to uh, work through some of these ideas as a group and why these conferences are great opportunities to kind of share these things out and, and see. Do we have to do it every day? I don't know. That's a great question. Uh, there in the chat. And so, you know, really thinking about doing our differentiated instruction um, can really be helpful. And this is something from um, a book, Bain in 2004, has a, a great book called um, What Great College Professors Do. Uh, and it really talked about the very best teachers offer a balance of the systematic and the messy. And I really do think that's, uh, that's a great way to describe it. It's okay if classes are messy and it's okay if classes don't quite go well um, because it shows we're varying it up, we're trying. Um, you know, I like to tell teachers that if we are doing a class 100% successful every class, we're probably not pushing, we're probably not innovating a little bit. Um, so how do we break that up? And so really thinking about um, are there different ways to deliver information are there different ways to um, let students participate in our course? Um, so that way they get novelty, we get novelty. And again, we balance out that systematic and the messy. Um, and really kind of thinking about this a little bit more, um, I'm gonna take a broader view of this than maybe a, a, the exact kind of classroom application of this, but pulling back just a little bit and thinking more about delivering out the, the material um, because, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities out there and there were a lot of great examples uh, in today's sessions and I'm sure there's gonna be plenty more tomorrow, but, you know, we can use video games to really kind of differentiate materials and give students different opportunities. We can use, as I mentioned, phone based media. Many of our students have the ability to record videos now or record audio and then edit those. Um, there's a lot of great software out there we can use. Um, leveraging social media for, you know, authentic communication with one another or with larger groups um, out there in the, the larger internet based community um, with the appropriate, you know, guidelines in place of how to interact with those folks. And then our collaborative projects through things like Google Docs or, you know, um, Microsoft Word Online, where they can collaborate and build presentations or projects together. Um, differentiating those can really give students that variety and they don't always have to be very high tech. Um, this is something that I really like to stress. And, you know, if you're looking for these ideas of, of balance between high tech and low tech, uh, if you haven't vi visited the American English website uh, at AmericanEnglish.state.gov, you'll see the link down there in the bottom corner. It can be a great place where you can find songs, you can find comic books, you can find um, webinars, you can find you know, lesson plans that have been kind of built around particular topics or particular pieces of technology, that could be a great place to start to kind of show you um, some ideas for for trying out ways to differentiate your instruction or, you know, using different materials that will match those learning objectives that you wrote way back in the, the backward design phase of this um, process that we're going through. And so, you know, thinking about this again, um, as I'm looking kind of my tools, thinking about differentiating my instruction, um, how does that lead to a, a productive and really engaging educational experience for our students? And here's where I mentioned, I wanna step back a little bit and take a little more broader look at this um, because I think it really helps clarify, clarify my thinking. And I hope it'll help you kind of clarify yours as well because there's just so much content out there um, and so many different software uh, pieces, websites that we can use um, with our students. And so I really like to think of it this way. Um, and this is a little Venn diagram that was developed by Garrison and Vaughn way back in 2008. And they kind of stepped back and they said, look, the educational experience has three pieces. We think about the social presence and the social presence is really letting the students engage in uh, risk-free expression, being able to kind of communicate and engage and have a voice in the actions of the classroom. And, you know, encouraging the collaboration, getting students to not just have a one-on-one -on -one with 
the teacher, but talking amongst themselves and with the teacher. So how do we foster that? That's a core component of the class and it really needs to be thought about and developed. And then the next part of this is the cognitive presence. So how are we exchanging information? How are we connecting ideas, um, analyzing new ideas to create new ideas and, and to create new and novel ways of speaking uh, in practicing our language and you know, developing our, our language uh, usage skills? And then finally, um, or maybe first, you know, thinking about the teaching presence. So how do we, you know, of course, set the curriculum and the methods and the sharing of, of personal meaning and, and really kind of focusing discussion when we need to in a classroom. And this is something where, you know, I work with educators and I say, let's think about this in kind of three big pieces where um, teaching presence, that's all you as in the educator. So that's very instructor led. Of course, you know, you're going to decide the curriculum, maybe, you know, with your school or university, of course. But thinking about what can students do to share that personal meaning so it feels authentic. Um, I think one of the, the biggest lessons learned for my university back in spring as we shifted from face to face to online was our students really uh, missed the engagement, talking with their fellow students, talking with their their instructors and their professors and a response that we got quite a bit from our professors on campus was that students were coming to their office hours time just to talk, just to kind of communicate and to help make that meaning with the content and with the, the faculty member. And so it's really kind of a critical part here. And that's all for us to think about. And then the next part is the social presence is let that be technology led. And so that's the way I always frame technology when I'm working with uh, educators I say, what is it that you need the students to be able to do? Uh, I want them to be able to work on something together. Okay, so we need uh, collaboration tools. So maybe, you know, Google Docs as an example, or I want them to be able to um, build meaning together. Ooh, building meaning, problem solving. Maybe we could find a game that would fit that and allow them to communicate in English to problem solve together. Um, so really kind of thinking about the social presence of your class, the community of it, uh, think about that as the way to, to use technology. And then of course, finally, the cognitive presence, um, really let the students take the lead there. So um, getting them to exchange the information, connecting new ideas. And again, going back to um, how these blend together, I want my students taking the lead to exchange information well, how are they going to do that? You know, what's the technology that's going to let them communicate and, and develop that social community of learners? So I'm um, really kind of considering that part out. And then once I've kind of landed on some of that technology for my classroom and, you know, thinking about really the technology as the classroom, because we no longer meet face to face. Um, I really like this material uh, created by Daniel Stanford. And it's a great way to think about using technology for different purposes in your class in terms of uh, low and high immediacy. So what we're able to do with the quickness of reply, the quickness of engagement between student and student or student and educator. And then uh, from the top to the bottom, we see high bandwidth and low bandwidth. And I always recommend as you're thinking about the technology to create your social presence in your class is to uh, choose from at least two, even better, three of these different quadrants in the square. Uh, so for example, I'm teaching an online class and um, I need my core critical information for my class, the syllabus, the schedule, the homework assignments. I don't want those to be within anything fancy. If it takes a lot of internet, my students could lose internet. They could not have the data to access the material. They may not be able to find the material. So instead, I tend to keep that core information of my class down in the green section. Um, look, syllabus, that's going to be a PDF that could be sent. It's super small. It's super light. I could send that with an email. I could post it on my Moodle page or my course management system. I could put that uh, in a WhatsApp group and send it out. Um, you know. So really kind of thinking about the core information of your class in the bottom uh, left corner there in the green, 
because it's low immediacy. My students don't need to interact with me about the syllabus necessarily, and it's low bandwidth. So my students don't need a lot of internet technology to be able to access it. Um, meanwhile, you know, I do want a lot of class discussion. So I've got my uh, top right corner, the, the red one there, where um, we could do video conferences. So we could use things like Hop2 here. Um, we could use Microsoft Teams or Discord. But the video conference means it's a high bandwidth. So I may save those for special occasions for, for just the class to have a discussion, to have a um, class problem solving task based learning activity, uh, maybe an audio conference if the Internet isn't great. So we just use audio. Um, but maybe the learning content I don't want in a video conference, because if my students miss the content matter, um, they may fall behind. So if a student can't make it to my online class, so I may shift my course content over to a more low immediacy. I'm going to lecture for a few minutes. I'll put it over in low immediacy because I'm not going to have a lot of interaction with my students, uh, but it's still high bandwidth. Um, so I might record a video. So I might do a flipped classroom approach where, hey, the uh, the lesson is in the five minute video that you're going to watch before class. You can access it. It's available, uh, you know, a week before class time. So you can find it if you need to go to the library to get Internet. You need to go to, um, you know, a, a friend's house to get your Internet. You can get it, download the video. Uh, watch it. And then when you come to class, let's use the live time. Let's think about the high bandwidth, uh, high immediacy part of class as um, something where we're doing lots of engagement. You know, I always uh, recommend that faculty or educators shy away from um, using live video and the students are just leaning back listening um, because it, it costs. It costs data, it costs time, and it, it can cause anxiety for students if they can't make it to an online class. So how do we balance that out? And of course, video conferencing isn't the end all be all for uh, interaction. So we could shift down into the blue and say, you know, look, a Google Doc allows for interaction. We could chat, we can text, we can um, write an essay or you know prepare a presentation together in a collaborative way, but it's a lot more low bandwidth. Um, students don't need a strong internet to access some of those tools compared to a live video feed. Um, so how do we balance these out? So this is kind of a really great quadrant that I love working with um, because it helps kind of frame where am I going to put things? Um, I actually like to print this out if possible, and we take all of the ideas the faculty have for their class and actually stick them in a quadrant. Say, OK, uh, your lectures, where are they going? OK, they're going there. Syllabus, where is it going? There. And then we can really step back and we can see uh, where the class is, is going to be in terms of, um, you know, immediacy and bandwidth. Um, so it could be really a great approach there. And then finally, uh, the last bit here as we kind of wind towards the end of uh, the talk um, is user design. This is something that um, we really kind of have to think about as educators, and it is a frequent topic of uh, stress for our students based on feedback that I receive. And, um, you know, as an educator, we can really think about, okay, here's what I'm going to do in class. I know I got this, this, and this. Um, we see it, but would an outsider, would someone unfamiliar with it, someone outside of the subject matter expertise, understand it just as clearly? So I really like to ask myself and ask educators that I work with, um, are my students asking how? Wait, how, how do I find the syllabus? How do I get to class? How do I... How do I do this? It's, it, the more hows we have, um, maybe it's time to tighten up that design. So we want to avoid students asking how. It should be very kind of clear. Um, and of course, you know, I always like to say, what's the story of my course? You know, as humans, we love to learn through stories. And so if we have, you know, even a video that you record at the, the beginning of your class and put up to say, here's what we're doing this week. Here's why we're doing it. And here's what we're going to learn as a result of that. It gives students that sort of narrative of where we're going for the week it can be really helpful if they just log on to your course where Canvas or Moodle or you know Blackboard and there's it's all content, but they can't put it together. Um, what do we do? How do we help them really see it clearly so they know what's going? 
And then finally, that active learning approach, you know, looking at the course material and saying, what are your students doing? Well, they're listening. Oh, so they're, they're leaning back. That's what they're doing. Um, what are they doing? Well, they're going to have 10 minutes to build a collaborative presentation about this particular topic, and then they're going to deliver it to another group of students who will um, score them based on this rubric. Ooh, all right, now I can see, I can really vision what your class is doing. Um, that could be a great way to kind of think about it because without those, our students really kind of can get lost. And so thinking about your class, not just from your point of view as a subject matter expert, as a, a pedagogical expert, and um, as an educator as a whole, but as a student who maybe is coming to this material for the first time. Uh, these are actual comments that we've received from, from students in a lot of our courses. They say, um, the courses have all these different platforms and I've never used them and maybe I'll never use again, I'm confused. Um, or they'll say, I'm, it's really hard to stay organized. I don't know where things are, um, or it's hard to keep track of deadlines and turn in assignments. You know. Um, when we're, we're teaching online, I really do recommend having your assignments, hey, you know, Sunday nights at 11.59 p.m., the homework is due. Or, you know, every Wednesday at noon, homework is due. The more consistent we can make it um, from week to week or class to class, the more predictable uh, it can be for our students. Routine um, is, is really kind of a, a great thing to have in an online class, and that may se seem like it contradicts what we said earlier, be active, be engaged, but also make it routine. Um, that's kind of the, the balance we need to strike as an educator. So, you know, I like to ask and say, what's your, what's your town square? So, you know, one of the things I love about traveling through, you know, South America or Europe that we just don't have in America is the town square. Hey, where are people? Where should I go? Go to the town square. You'll find someone there. Um, same thing with your class. The students should always have that place. Oh, I'm going to go there first, and that's where I'll find everything I need. Um, so what's the town square of your class is, is kind of a, a great way to think about this. Um, you know, as Heidi's mentioning, so, so much empathy for students navigating this great phrase, digital experiment we're all living through. Um, it's exactly it. And so, um, how can we help them navigate? What is that shining star in the sky they can guide their ship with? Um, again, where's the course course located? Where can they find all this information? And then, um, you know, that familiarity of, of having that town square, so to speak. Um, and then it's the same. Oh, there's week one. Same thing as, you know, week two, same. Week three, objectives, schedule assignments, objectives, schedule assignments down through there. And that predictability is really comforting for the students. Leave the messiness. You know, we have a systematic in the online course and leave the messiness for the interaction they're having with you. Uh, you know, as Bain said in, in his book, the messy and the uh, systematic. And then of course, um, accessibility. One thing I always like to ask my uh, educators that I'm working with who, you know, do they know where to go? Can your students find what they need when they need it? Um, if they are being asked to look at something and they have to go back three clicks or go to a different piece of software to find that thing, um, they're going to get lost. So how do we keep it all condensed all in the same place? And then uh, flexibility. And this is something that came up in a few different talks today that I thought was really great. Um, how do we give them multiple ways to respond? Right. So maybe some students don't have access to X tool. So can they use something else? Uh, who was it today? It was, uh, let me check my notes. It was um, Romina. So I'm sorry, Romina. Romina Marzita talked about this, of giving students multiple ways to respond. They could use the chat. They could use voice. Uh, they could use the cards like we, we talked about earlier. Um, the more that you can kind of allow that flexibility, um, it'll really help students complete the assignments. And then finally, uh, as I just mentioned, repetition in an online course is really helpful uh, to making sure students succeed. And so um, finally, you know, kind of winding down here um, towards the, the end of the talk and, and the end of the first day of, of our conference here, um, I'm really kind of curious to hear from you. Uh, so instead of kind of saying, do you have any questions, 
I'd really like to know, well, what did you learn today that you think everybody should should know about? And I know a lot of it's been happening over there in the chat, but um, yeah, what did you learn today? And what are you looking to learn tomorrow? Uh, maybe we can use that as kind of a point to, to have a discussion here towards the end of this talk. And uh, I'm gonna kind of poke around here in the chat if people don't mind and, and just see uh, some of the great conversation that I missed. Uh, it may, uh, maybe Hope has a word there. I'm not, I was reading all the questions. It was a, a really good talk. Uh, it's always nice listening to you. And thank you for the mention at the beginning. I was not exercising just in case. But yeah, there are a lot of great activities. <laughs> for those who don't um, know, Hote did this motion capture where he had students would have to make a gesture and they could answer a multiple choice test. It was really great. Uh, kind of physical learning. TPR technology and learning. So they, they are talking a lot about the concept of backward design. Mm. I think that is very interesting. And it's actually, I think it, it would be great to have something very practical on that because it takes time. You need to practice. It does. It um, does. That is not something where you can just kind of hop into backward design. It does take a lot of kind of planning and practice. And so, um, you know, I can share some links and I'll, I'll share this uh, PowerPoint with folks and they can kind of click on some of the links and explore. But, um, you know, really kind of breaking that habit of textbook, then lesson plan. We start with lesson plan, then then textbook. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's good that you mentioned about your PowerPoint, because people were asking, like they were saying that, what, what, can we get the material out? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. And I think, you know, it was, it's really important for a keynote to take stock of what happened. And so it was funny because I spent all day with the webinar open. I'm watching a session, updating my PowerPoint at the same time. I'm like, oh, you know, Beatrice had a great example. I'm going to put, you know, mention that, what uh, what she talked about, or Jamila talked about that. And so uh, I apologize. I don't have my material up, but it was changed in real time um, because of all the great ideas I heard today. But it's okay. We can e e email to all the attendees that later. So once you give it to us, we can email them so they can receive it. So no problem about that. They say, tomorrow I want to keep learning from amazing people experiences. I think the good thing about this uh, the, today, I guess, all, and we're going to see that tomorrow too, is that there were a lot of connections. Like people are interacting a lot, even in the chat asking questions, answering, helping each other. And that is what teachers normally do. And that I love that about that. This yeah, quality that we have. Fantastic to watch. I mean, and we've seen, you know, a challenge global in scale. And the first thing teachers did was, I've got an idea. I'll share it with you. You share it with your idea. And, and I think, um, you know, that's, it's just, anytime I start to feel a little down, I just jump on like Twitter and look at teachers and just like, oh yeah. We're, we're doing it. We're, we're surviving. We're making it. Um, and there is a question for you. Which approaches are we using? Well, for everybody, no? Flip, me, flip methodology, natural approach, TPEG. I think when, from what you said is basically it's a mix of everything and whatever works for your students. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not someone who um, likes to commit to a particular, you know, idea. This is the way it must be done. Um, you know, I, I think every good teacher senses the room of what their students need. Um, but I think, you know, if you, it sounds strange, but if you plan well enough, you're open to anything. Um, you know, I think if you're confident in where you're going with your class, you can accommodate what students need. Um, and so for me, having a particular approach, um, besides just kind of really thinking about that backward design process of, you know, carefully kind of considering the way I design the class, um, everything else, you know, I can, I can wing it because I've got the skills and I've got the material because I thought it all out in advance. Um, and it's not easy to do the first time, the second time. It's not easy to do for my 20th time, but you get there, you get better each time. Great, 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 great. I think people are super happy with your presentation, as oh, always. <laughs> now I get to enjoy tomorrow. That's the best part. I get to hang out tomorrow, chat with everybody, try the networking feature, which I didn't get to do today. Well, we still have time. Talking about that, we, we still have time to visit the expo hall after this. 
we have like an hour to do so and yeah one hour to visit the expo hall or go networking if you plan to do so uh, meet other teachers or presenters so that is maybe you can meet jeff over there exchange contact information so thank you one again thank you again jeff it's always nice to have you to talk to you and i think everybody enjoyed your presentation thanks to you and relo andes and uh you know rachel martin for putting this all together and, and thanks for the all the great you know well wishes in the, in the chat and just the support of the community so thank you to everyone